Hi. <laughs> Thank you for being here. Hey. Welcome. How are you doing? Welcome, welcome. Yes. The sofas are yours. Gorgeous <laughs> things. Is this working? Yeah. How is everyone? Good, 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 good. So I'm going to start with a little intro and then I'm going to introduce my wonderful girls. But for anyone who doesn't know what Girls Talk is, it is a community-led organization dedicated to promoting the mental health and well-being of adolescent girls and young women. I started Girls Talk with the goal of creating safe spaces both on and offline, where girls can access mental health resources, share their experiences, and support each other so they never feel alone in their mental health journeys. When I was younger, I struggled, like many, with my mental health. I felt like I had nowhere to turn and feared that, like so many other girls, I'd be written off as dramatic or hysterical. I ignored my problems, hoping that they would go away. Instead, they snowballed, leading me to a dark breaking point. Way too often, our society only recognizes mental health when we reach crisis levels. It took me reaching rock bottom to get the help I needed all along. Through Girls Talk, I wanted to change the culture of only recognizing mental health when it reaches crisis levels to one of prevention. <laughs> When I started Girls Talk, I had no idea that my experience would touch so many people around the world. It just shows how many people out there actually experience similar things but never express it. Here at Girls Talk, we believe in the power of storytelling as a catalyst for change. By fostering a space of community, safety and security, we aim to empower young girls and women to share their own mental health experiences. These stories help to normalize mental health conversations and help us to feel less alone in our journeys. So, without further ado, I am honored to welcome two extraordinary young ladies, McKenna and Dawn, alumni of the Girls Talk Ambassadors Program. They exemplify the very essence of our mission and are mental health advocates who embody our core values. So please join me in extending a warm, Welcome to my girls, McKenna and Dawn. So we have a slight time constraint, so I'm gonna get straight to it. I wanna first start with your personal experiences and what led you to be becoming um, advocates for mental health and what was the turning point for you in recognizing this as a major importance in your life. Yeah, I can start. Um, my name is Dawn, and when I first applied for the ambassadorship program, I was in a space where I felt very alone and unable to express myself authentically, both as an immigrant in my community, but also as a Ugandan immigrant as well. And as well, I also found in my personal relationship, specifically um, my brothers, who are now 14 and 19, were having a lot of difficulty expressing their mental health challenges as young black men. And I think especially when I saw their struggles and their own difficulty finding these spaces and finding communities, I felt the need and was kind of hungering for a community that would have both space but also foster vulnerability, authenticity, and sincerity. Yeah, I think my story is pretty similar. I found Girls Talk when I was feeling very isolated and alone, and during this time, there weren't many spaces in, on the digital platform that fostered vulnerability and authenticity. Um, and when I found Girls Talk, I really resonated with your story, Ajua, and I saw a lot of parallels to my own story, and I um, didn't see anyone really vocalize the struggles that come with mental health so openly. Um, and I realized I really wanted to be a part of the organization any way I could. So I decided to make a conscious choice to start being more authentic online. And I actually was able to publish an essay for Girls Talk, and I saw the impact of the community because the women that it resonated with, I still talk to today, and this was years ago. So I'm really thankful for that. 
So one of the major things that girls talk, and I think the backbone to what we do is stigma, um, stigma reduction. So I suppose this is directed at both of you, but mental health stigma remains a significant barrier to seeking help. How can we work towards dismantling these stigmas, particularly addressing the unique challenges faced by young women and girls from black and minority ethnic backgrounds? You know, I think that's such a layered question, and I can speak from my personal experience and try to shed some light on it. I feel like society as a whole, when we think of mental health in terms of black and brown bodies, we often see our resilience and our strength as an innate character traits rather than protection mechanisms that we've adopted from years of personal trauma and generational trauma. And so in these clinical spaces, and even when we seek help in our own community, we're often dismissed. So I think it really comes down to listening to people, listening to black women, supporting women, uplifting them, and allowing them to feel seen and heard. From my experience as well, as a black woman, I've also found that, again, the hyper-resilience narrative can in turn kind of encourage and force black women to have to shout in order to be heard. So once again, actively listening to black women and minority voices and marginalized voices as well. But I think, once again, in terms of having to shout to be heard, there's this narrative of hyper-aggression and anger that is often labeled on black women but I think it's essential to kind of dismantle these narratives by both investing in research for black mental health, but also black women's mental health specifically and the mental health of black girls as well to kind of prevent the breaking points that we often have to encounter and shout in order to be heard. So when I first started Girls Talk, I think what what I was really aiming to do, not only was it to create a safe space for all of us, but what I found was that I was kind of bombarded with great resources, but also ones that felt quite fluffy, that felt quite opportunist. So, and I think we are at a time where we're kind of thrown these quite trendy words, so to speak. And so I want to talk about the care um, sorry, the trend of self-care that has gained momentum, especially amongst young girls and women. What are some of the specific self-care practices or strategies you personally do to support and maintain your mental well-being? Yeah, I can start. I was talking to McKenna about this, and it may sound quite odd, but recently I be began to kind of talk to myself a lot more. I realized that I was very disconnected to myself in my daily life, and I found that the best way to kind of come back to myself and to authentically empathize with myself was even just having conversations with myself in the mirror and taking that time to connect with myself in the same ways that I had been connecting with people throughout the day. Just seeing a way to kind of empathize my own experience and humanize myself, but also connecting about with my inner world and being more present in my reality. So I think this self-care practice I kind of implemented throughout the summer, but it's kind of become more and more of a routine now. And I think, once again, those images of self-care, I originally had like a very specific image of having a face mask and putting one on and kind of that whole routine, but kind of dismantling it and seeing what worked for me specifically and what allowed me to be grounded and more present in my reality um, allowed me to kind of put this more in practice and show up as myself, my authentic self. Absolutely. I think um, the older that I get, the more that I stop searching for validation to validate my existence. And a lot of the times when we talk about self-care, sure, getting a pedicure is great, getting a facial is great, but what internally can you do to show up for yourself where it's a radical form of self-love? And so I challenge myself every day now to show up as my authentic self and to honor myself. And I feel that it not only heals parts of myself that have gone unnoticed or parts of myself where I had to be reduced or put into boxes um, to diminish myself, but I find that the interactions that I have are actually much more authentic. And in some ways, it's also healing for somebody else to be able to talk to someone who's showing up without a mask on and it's truly themselves. Because I don't think we can speak about self-care if we're not talking about privilege. Mm -hmm. You know, I think 
one of the great things that we've learned at Girls Talk through storytelling is that, you know, it's all well and good telling someone to go and have a bath or, you know, get a gym membership. But how is that going to relate to someone in the middle of nowhere from a different community who's a single mother who is supporting her children, her husband, whatever it might be, you know? Um, so, I mean, McKenna, you mentioned interactions, and that leads me on to community. Um, in, in, oh, I got really confused there. <laughs> I got really confused there. Let's just talk about community. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> You've got to be yourself. I'm a bit tired, but I'm very happy to be here. So. In a world where women and girls continually face pressure from the home, the workplace, and society at large, what are some of the prevalent mental health challenges you have noticed amongst girls and young women? And what are the primary concerns within this community? Yeah, you know, I think there's such a duality to the digital world. There's such a beauty to it to where we can connect with people from all parts of the world and share stories and resonate with people that we might never meet. Um, but there's also a darkness to it. And I feel like, especially after the pandemic, we're still recovering for this need for human connection. Um, and what I'm finding is that although there's a lot more openness on the digital world, like Girls Talk, which is beautiful, there's also a lot more of comparison mode and women and girls trying to keep up in this society that wasn't really built to sustain us. So although we are trying to show our authentic selves, it also becomes this level of competition and comparison that is really dwindling to our mental health at large. Yeah, I can definitely connect with that. And I was going to talk about a bit more, both with that comparison and that competition there's a sense of alienation that can result from that, especially with the weight and the nature of some of these issues and external and internal pressures. I feel that at times feeling unseen, disconnected, unheard, or even misrepresented or underrepresented can feel further alienating and isolating to individuals who need support and need help. So I think this can be especially challenging when even through social media, we feel connected. We also feel in many ways alone. And I think connecting with communities and finding the people that authentically represent but also allow for people to express themselves sincerely, I think is such a necessary um, measure to kind of avoid that sense of isolation and detachment from one another. And I want to finish off with responsibility. What responsibilities do leaders, governments, and policymakers have in shaping effective mental health policies and initiatives? And how can their actions contribute to creating a more healthy, mentally, mentally healthy society? And I suppose, I mean, there's quite a few questions. So, um, And how can they collaborate with mental health advocates and organizations like Girls Talk to create comprehensive and culturally sensitive mental health policies that address the unique needs of diverse communities? I think when it comes to talking about marginalized com communities and communities of diversity, um, there's three things for me that come to mind, which are accountability, education, and accessibility. I think it's time for law and policymakers and high-ranking officials in government to truly take accountability for the impact of colonialism and the way that it infiltrates these mental health spaces, these healthcare spaces at large. Um, we tend to view mental health treatment from a one-size-fits-all lens that just doesn't work for communities of color. And so when it comes to educating people, it's time to educate people in the fields, time to bring that to our school system, and so we can truly make it an accessible scope for everybody. I definitely, I definitely agree with that. And I was also going to talk about how we, in many ways, need to do that as well, but also strengthen prevention efforts. I've been to so many talks and sessions, and seeing the emphasis on prevention is so heartwarming and knowing how essential that is in making a change and making a difference. So I think, once again, 
everything you said, McKenna, but also that prevention aspect and making sure that it doesn't get to this point in order for action to be necessary. And I think this question will resonate with all of us, but looking back, you know, I created Girls Talk for many reasons, but because I was in this constant search of community and a safe space, and I look back on that younger person, and, and there are so many things that I would like to tell them, you know, having got through um, certain, you know, hard places within my life. So I want to ask you girls, like, if you could speak to your, your younger self, what would you say to them? You are more than enough. Yeah. You do not have to try to diminish your multidimensionality into boxes that society has created for you. You are capable, you are worthy of taking up space and being in rooms that you do not feel worthy in. And you don't have to feel like an imposter when you're just trying to live. Mm -hmm. I think I would definitely tell my younger self that you deserve to be here. In many ways, when I immigrated to the United States and left Uganda, I felt a sense of displacement, but also a sense of non-deservingness and not deserving to be in these spaces. Even as I was talking to McKenna, being here with such amazing people, such well-achieved people, I was in some ways also affirming this to myself today, throughout the week, saying, you deserve to be here, because I do deserve to be here, and I deserve to occupy space and not reduce or limit myself in ways that people would either be comfortable with or understand, so yeah. So, I mean, to all of you out there, I would take a moment after this to ask yourselves that question, um, but, what I can say is I am immensely proud to be part of this community, to be part of their community, and I am very grateful that you all showed up today. So thank you so, so, so much. Thank you. Thank you.